You're traveling to another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of vegetables and rodents. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop. Hello, 12 by 12 participants. This is Julie Headland, your fearless leader. And today I am so excited to introduce you to one of my very favorite author illustrators, Peter Brown, who has kindly agreed to be our featured author for September. Peter is the author and or illustrator of nine picture books for children, including his most recent, Creepy Carrots, which won him the Caldecott Honor Award for illustration. His new book, Mr. Tiger Goes Wild, hits the shelves this month. The official release day is September 3rd, so please go and show your support for Peter and thank him for being our featured author by going and buying Mr. Tiger, which is a fabulous book. Ever since I heard Peter present about Mr. Tiger at the New Jersey CBWI conference in June, I have been waiting with eager anticipation to get my hands on this book, and you should too. Without further ado, please welcome Peter. Thank you for doing this, by the way. I should start with, by saying that all, not only am I so excited to have you because I've been a fan for so long, but I don't think I've ever had an author illustrator as a featured author for 12 by 12 before. So Only, only, all, only straight up authors. Only straight up authors, all right. right. Now, you'll, now you're dipping your toes into the... The, the wild and crazy... The water. <laughs> right. All right, let's get officially started. So first I will say once again, thank you so much for contributing your time and expertise to the 12 by 12 group. I'm sure they're gonna be very excited. Which, which tends to come first to you, the pictures or the words? Uh, these days it's all, it's different. I mean, I, I, I used to call myself an illustrator who writes because drawing and painting were my first loves, you know. I. I've been drawing my whole life and, and telling stories with pictures, but I was the art kid when I was growing up, and so I always kind of identified myself as that. And so in the beginning, I think a lot of my stories originated with pictures or images in my imagination, something like that, and then I'd kind of find words to match the story or the pictures. But these days, you know, I feel like I'm basically equal parts author, illustrator, because I spend so much more time focusing on the story, focusing on the text and um, just the ideas. Uh, and sometimes I'll play with the story for a long time with the words and then not get to the sketches until after I have kind of a story plotted out hmm. or something. Um, so it's always a little different. So your process has changed from when you first started. And well, is the truth it... is it's never the same. Every book is different. Right, Some right. books I have an image in my head and that begins the process. Other times, it's a sentence that begins the process, you know, and most of the time, it's kind of in between. It's, I have an image and a couple of words, and I just start start with those and build on those. Right. But, uh, but it's always different. I wrote a blog post after the New Jersey conference. It's something that you said really resonated with me. You were talking about how you just play in the beginning without putting any kind of direction to the story like you were you were talking about your sketches for Lucy and um, some of the free thinking that you did before Mr. Tiger and that struck me in particular because it's something I'm really bad at doing it's like this story will go from point A to point B to point C if I have to kill it in the process <laughs> at what point do you kind of cut yourself off and say I've explored this and now I'm gonna I'm gonna take this direction it's not easy I kind of feel like out of a hundred different ideas that pass through my mind, one of them is good. And so just by crunching the numbers, I have to churn through ideas. I've got to go through a hundred ideas for every good idea. So I have to go through hundreds or thousands of ideas to have a few good ideas that I can put together. And so part of the beginning of the process for me is just 
churning through ideas, good ideas, bad ideas, whatever, just getting ideas out of my imagination onto a page, whether they're drawings or whether they're ideas for dialogue or whatever. Um, I just try to get as much out as possible because usually the first ideas in my case, it's not always this case, but a lot of times my first ideas aren't the best ideas, and so I have to get them out. But at a certain point, you're right, you have to kind of commit to your idea and that can be tricky, which is why I have, I think, probably not the greatest reputation at my publishing houses that I work with because I have the habit of going back and reworking things when the book is like, basically, they think it's done. And I'm like, oh, but wait, can you reword this? And maybe, oh, I think I might want to change this illustration a bit up until the very end. Eventually, they have to just be like, listen, Tuesday is the deadline. <laughs> Nothing changes after Tuesday. So do what you need to do. But Tuesday is it, and then I'm like, okay, 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 and I try to get all my, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of scary because once the book is done, it's done forever, and you know, I want to have as few regrets as possible. So, <laughs> what regrets do you have about any of your books? Oh well, you know, like just maybe I would have worded something a little differently, or maybe I would have drawn a character's expression a little differently, or you know, a lot of times there are things that only I would notice, right? But I still notice them, and uh, you know, I want my books to be the best things they can possibly be. So, right, I have the habit of just tinkering with them until the very last possible moment. Yeah. Most, much to the frustration of my publisher. Tell me uh, how you got started, actually, because a lot of the twelve by twelve members are new and pre-published, and um, don't have publishers swinging clubs over their heads with deadlines <laughs> and you know and it's yeah. pa- pa- it's it's a similar challenge when you are think trying to get something quote unquote submission ready you know when you're sending it to editors or agents yeah how did that work for you i got my first book deal 10 years ago nine and a half years ago something like that and i feel like the the industry's changed a little bit in those 10 years and now there's really no un- solicited manuscripts, you know, submissions. Um, when I was trying to get my foot in the door, uh, I had I had been a member of SCBWI already for a couple of years. I joined when I was in college. And um, so I had all this good information about how to submit things and who might be interested in my work and about conferences and whatnot. Um, so I was kind of on the ball with all that stuff. At that point, I was sending stuff out because it was still generally accepted. You could just send submissions to publishers. What I did actually at the time was I sent to art directors rather than right. to editors because I thought, well, I'm an illustrator. I'll send them a sketch dummy with pretty pictures and they're because the, they're the art director and maybe if they like it, they can like sneak it onto somebody's desk who can actually give me a book deal. So that was my plan and it worked pretty well because I had a good response from a bunch of art directors at big house, publishing houses and they all kind of put me in touch with editors. None, none of it worked out, but I had made good contacts that way. What ended up getting me my first book deal actually was being in the right place at the right time. I moved to New York, where I still live, and went to a party. It was an illustration party, but it wasn't. It was mostly for editorial illustration rather than for children's books. So I didn't go there expecting to meet anybody in children's books, but it just so happened that I stumbled into four people who worked at Little Brown Books for Young Readers, and one of them turned out to be my editor, and she's been my editor ever since. So I got a little lucky, but I also had a sketch dummy ready to go, and right. I had all this other all this other work that I had done before meeting my editor, Alvina Ling. Um, Luck is where chance meets opportunity, right? Like you, right, yeah. you had everything ready. It wasn't yeah. as if you were oh, it just suddenly that evening had the idea that you might like to <laughs> illustrate. You had your ducks in a row. I was very but, prepared. Right. Very prepared, and and I'm pretty confident that even if I had met Alvina that night, that I would have, I already had a literary agent who kind of found me because of, through my website, uh, so I feel like I would have wound up finding a book deal. Wow, your agent before. found you through your website? Those are the kind of stories that seem mythical, like, but it actually really happens. To... Well, ten years ago, yeah. his book website was kind of a novel thing, and mm-hmm. my agent was. Um, he was an assistant agent. He was just kind of, I was the first client he ever signed up. Wow. Um, and so he was young and eager. His name's Paul Rodin. He's still my agent now. You know, he and I had some, there's some distant connection. Like we had mutual friends of friends of friends type of thing. And so somehow he ended up clicking around to my website 
and then emailed me through my website. So right. I got a little fortunate there too, but that's a little more kind of, that kind of thing happens still. Um, if you're, I mean, it's a little fortunate, but. Yeah, but I mean, you know, you're putting yourself out there in a way that is professional and shows that you have some knowledge and desire and um, talent, etc. And so when those conditions do turn into something like an agent happens upon your website or you meet Alvina Ling at a party, then yeah. you're, you're good to go. What's the difference in your mind between illustrating somebody else's words versus your own? Actually easier to illustrate somebody else's story. Well, let me rephrase that. I think it's less stressful to illustrate somebody else's story because a lot of the decisions are being made without me. When I'm writing and illustrating my own book, it's all me, you know? Mine is the only name that goes on the cover. If something doesn't work, it's my fault, really. You know, my editor, of course, tries to help me smooth things out, but, you know, ultimately I'm the one who, <laughs> who takes the credit or the, or the blame or whatever, and, you know, I want to make great books, and so I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, and when I'm illustrating somebody else's story, I put about half as much pressure on myself, you know, as I would if I were doing the whole thing, which actually feels like a relief at times. I remember when I finished making The Curious Garden, which was my fourth book, um, writing and illustrating it. That was a really involved book, and it kind of kicked my butt. And when it was over, I illustrated a book called The Purple Kangaroo, which I didn't write, which was written by Ian, Michael Ian Black. And it felt so good to just have, it was almost like a vacation. It was like <laughs> a paid vacation, because I had none of the stress. Like, it was just fun. I just got to kind of dive into this thing and goof around, and I had other people to bounce ideas off of, and I didn't feel quite as alone. And so... It was a little more pleasant of an experience. Yeah. That being said, if I had to choose, I would prefer to do it all because my I, the most satisfying part of my job is getting my ideas out of my imagination and onto a page where I can share them with other people. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Obviously, you lean toward doing both, but what um, what happens in the case of a manuscript? Do, do they come to you from your agent? There's a million ways for it to happen. Um, in my case, the purple kangaroo, I think... The editor, Justin Chanda at Simon & Schuster, read the manuscript and thought I'd be a great illustrator for it. He and I kind of knew, we knew each other already and been talking about collaborating at some point. Justin Chanda and I had been talking about working together. And so when he got that manuscript, he thought I'd be perfect for it. He sent it over to me. It looked good to me and my agent, and so we signed that up. And I think it was, uh, it was just a one-book deal. But then when we finished that, we had a good experience, and so he signed me up for another two book deal just without any specific titles just he just wanted to work with me a couple more times at least so um, so then I made Creepy Carrots which was the first of that two book deal and that book came about in kind of a funny way because Aaron Reynolds the author of Creepy Carrots and I have the same literary agent oh. so Paul Rodine our agent saw Aaron's manuscript saw that I had a contract with Simon & Schuster and decided to combine it all into one super book deal for himself. Right. Why not? Um, right. <laughs> exactly. So, of course, Simon and Schuster had to sign off on it. Right. But Paul Rodin brought Aaron's manuscript to Simon and Schuster and said, "Here's a great manuscript. I know Peter has a deal with you guys, and he's already seen the manuscript and likes it. So we could kill two birds with one stone right here, right now, if you want to." And everybody was on board, so that worked out. But I still have to figure out. But the next book is going to be with Simon & Schuster. We haven't, we haven't figured that out yet. So. Yeah. As writers, when we're working on manuscripts and submitting, we're told to, quote-unquote, leave room for the illustrations. We want to do that, but it's very difficult when you don't have the pictures to go along with it and you're trying to convey something in the manuscript right. that may not be obvious. And we're told don't use a ton of art notes and, and that kind of thing. So... First, what's your advice about that to, to people who are who are submitting uh, manuscripts only? And secondly, when you see a manuscript, um, like for maybe you could use one of the two that you've illustrated. You know, did you did you end up did they end up cutting words out because you were able to do something with the illustrations? So I think first of all, one of the best things an author can do of picture books is be realistic and realize that their words are going to change. And frankly, their words probably should change because they're called picture books for a reason because the pictures are doing 
most of the work. They're visual stories. And if a picture is worth a thousand words or whatever, then then the pictures of the picture book are doing most of the storytelling. So um, just accept that, and that'll help you make better books, you know. So, for example, when I was working on Creepy Carrots, there were a couple instances where Aaron had used some description in his text, and, you know, I didn't have much choice but to illustrate what he had written, because otherwise it wouldn't have worked. So I basically illustrated some of the things that he had described, and we realized that we didn't need that description at all because the pictures did the describing for us. So in that case, we cut off, we cut, we edited down some of his text, and that was a smart move. And so an author has to be comfortable with that. If you expect your story to stay intact, this is the wrong business for you. <laughs> so I think art notes are actually okay, but they have to be really simple. They have to be, you know describing the mood of the scene or something vague like that because inevitably the illustrator who is so well versed in visual storytelling will have ideas that you don't so if you box them in with too many art notes you're going to be limiting them and this is what their expert their expertise is right so you don't want to limit them at what they're best at so you have to give you can give art notes but they should be very simple and deliberate you know and um, what frustrates me is when I see a manuscript and their art notes that with just arbitrary information, you know, like uh, like the pink, the house is pink, and there's pretty flowers around it, and there's a bright blue sky, and you realize that none of that has anything to do with the story whatsoever. It's just that the author likes pink houses, and it's like, well, that's not enough, right? If the story were about, you know, people who wore pink all the time, and their house was pink, and their pets were dyed pink, and everything was pink, well, then of course it would make sense for them to have a pink house, but otherwise it doesn't. So. So there's that, there's all that, and then also I think when I read a manuscript, usually what I'm looking for is I want some spark in my imagination right away. Like before I, during my first reading, my imagination should start spinning right away. And if it doesn't, then it's used, it's probably not for me. Um, now of course a lot of those early ideas will end up changing drastically through the course of the, of the development and production of the book. but. But if my imagination is firing right away, that's a really good sign. So mm-hmm. that's one of the key things that I look for. Do you do that yourself when you're working on a book, like edit words out when you get an idea for a picture? On the ones that I'm writing and illustrating? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, mm-hmm. it's like, honestly, I think that's the single sort of greatest art form. The, the greatest part of this art form is that that play between the words and the pictures, right? Mm-hmm. Conveying a story, a linear story, or or non-linear story, but con- con- conveying some sort of a relatable story, frankly, with as few words as possible. Now, I don't really have much interest in making a wordless book, because part of the fun for me is reading aloud. And I like, it's... and one of the fun challenges is creating words that flow together nicely, that have kind of a rhythm, that are fun to say, fun to read back, fun, maybe there's some response, maybe, uh, you know, I don't know, sound effects, dialogue, like all that is part of the fun of it for me. So I'm not that interested in making a wordless picture book, but I'm really interested in paring down the text as simply as possible to as simple as possible and and letting the pictures do all the heavy lifting. So right. I'm constantly going back and forth on my own. And I might add, if people don't know, you won a Caldecott honor for that book. Congratulations again. Thank you very much. Do you feel pressure as a result of that? Is that just a great thing, or does then, like, your mind start spinning like, oh, God, now what? That's the downside of winning a Caldecott. Well, it does add pressure, because now, you know, I mean, it's just, it kind of elevates your status and, like, my exposure. Uh, It's all good stuff, but I want to keep that momentum going, really. And so... You know, I'm actually glad that I basically finished Mr. Tiger before winning the Caldecott honor. If I won the honor while I was working on Mr. Tiger, I probably would have driven myself crazy trying to just to like surpass creepy carrots and, you know, make this the best thing ever. Um, And that probably would have ended up being detrimental to the whole process. So, but I definitely, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, an award I never thought I was going to win, and so now I'm sort of taking myself more seriously. Which, <laughs> I, don't know if that's, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, I, I, it's, it can be a struggle to just have it all be fun. Like that's the thing about getting paid to do what you love to do. 
I did this my whole life just for fun, and now all of a sudden it's my profession, and it changes the, your perspective on it. And you know, I find myself not. I don't really write and draw a whole lot in my free time because I spend so much of my time working, writing, and drawing that when I'm not working, I want to kind of do all the other things that are important to me. Right. Uh, that's a really before, good point. It was like that was the fun thing. That was the thing I couldn't wait to do was my to draw in my free time. And now it's like I can't wait to not draw in my free time. You know? <laughs> or that's not always true. Of course, there are times when I get inspiration, but but uh, but it's just a different feeling now than it used to be. It's a really good point, actually, um, because you know so many people who are on the other side, you know, still trying to break in, um, think of you know, your position as being like Nirvana, you know, you, you're set, you're going to keep getting book deals, you've had success, you're, and, but I, but I think that, um, before you're published, um, you can do anything you want, you know, you can write anything you want, you don't have deadlines, you don't have, and there's, again, that freedom to play, so I think it's, uh, I think it's really interesting the idea the notion that that can change and does change once you've had a certain amount of success that perhaps you don't feel like you have as much freedom and somehow you know you have to protect the joy yeah it's not always easy you know i remember when i was in art school it was like four years of total experimentation and you know of course we all wanted to end up having a cool art style by the end of those four years but three years of it or three and a half of those years were spent just kind of having fun and trying things out and it was it was amazing and I really kind of wish I could kind of go back to that time again because now it's like well first of all if you're an illustrator you kind of have to have a certain style it doesn't have to be perfectly consistent with every book but there has to be kind of a thread of consistency through your work and so I don't necessarily feel like I could just pick up and try something completely new um, I'd have to kind of put it through the Peter Brown filter and, and, and make it feel a little more like my work. Um, so there's a little bit less freedom in that way, I think. Now, of course, I'm putting that restriction on myself. I could do whatever I want, but it's a business. And if you want to be successful, you got to sell books. You've got to be mindful of these things. And I don't know if I'm comfortable with basically starting from scratch because... If I make a book that is completely unlike any of my other books, somebody walks into a bookstore, they see it, they may not realize it's me. They may not even pick it up, even if they like all my other books, um, because they don't realize it's me. In fact, with Creepy Carrots, a lot of people came up to me and said that they had they, they didn't realize it was me, my book, until until I won the Caldecott Honor, and they actually like paid a little more attention to it, and they connected the dots. But um, So that freedom to experiment and try different things is tricky. I think illustrators have a little more to think in that way. I think authors have freedom to kind of do whatever they want because their books are all going to look different anyway because there's going to be different illustrators or different designers attached to them for the most part. Um, Right. Although I think that if, I think the same thing is true. If an author breaks out, you know, I mean, look at Fancy Nancy, for example, you know, I mean, they break out with a really successful book and then the publisher wants to do like, 800 permutations of that same book and and I I do know authors who've had success with a particular series who have to keep writing you know they feel like they have to keep writing those characters that because it's the decisions you have to make it's gonna bring in you know bring in the money kind of thing and um people may be less accepting of a book that's just kind of completely different in tone or style also, you know, from a writer. I, I'm certainly not suggesting that I'm going to, like, make all my creative decisions based on what I think will be good for book sales. I would say nine times out of ten, we should decide to just go for whatever feels best for our own creative development. But it's not, it can't hurt to at least consider the sort of repercussions of making drastic style changes. What advice would you give for authors and illustrators starting out today in terms of setting themselves up as you did? How do you, how would you tell them to set themselves up for success? Well, I think you have to be a hard, a tough critic on yourself. Um, For me, it wasn't enough to get published. I wanted to make good books. 
I put a lot of pressure on myself to to do good work and and I basically hate everything I've ever done. You know, it's like I wish I could love it a little bit more. I'm not sure I've got the right formula exactly, but um, <laughs> because I, I should probably enjoy things a little bit more. But the bottom line is, what drives me is the desire to tell stories in my imagination and tell them as best I possibly can. And I think I meet a lot of people at, at SCBWI conferences and just around in the world who have an idea for a kids' book and they're excited about it, but maybe they're not used to sort of critiquing themselves very uh, intensely, you know. And after going through Art Center College of Design, which is where I went to school, we got it drilled in our heads that you have to really, you have to really be hard on yourself and look at this work with a fine tooth comb. I think if you want to make it in this business, you've got to, you've got to try to do really good work. There's always going to be a market for quality books. So there's that. Um, SCBWI is such a great thing. I'm so glad it exists because I constantly get emails from people asking me how to get started in this business, and I don't even know what I would tell them if SCBWI <laughs> didn't exist, you know? I know. Um, so it's like, you go, you, you read the paper, the literature, you go to the conferences, you network, you learn, you, you know, broaden your horizons, and you get a much healthier kind of perspective on this business and your, what you want to do. Peter Brown. Why are you grateful to be able to create books for children? Well, this is probably what, what everybody says, but this is, the, this is the thing I've loved to do my entire life, is writing stories, drawing pictures, creating characters and worlds. And I have to say, almost every day I sit down in my studio and I think to myself, I am so lucky that I get paid to do this. In fact, when I... When I do a lot, I do a lot of school visits, and I visit. You know, I'll talk to kids about what I do for a living, and I make the point of even saying that I get paid to do this because I want kids to know that that's kind of it's a job that you could actually create for yourself if you want it, and um, and this is my job, and it's kind of hard to believe. You know, there's nothing. My favorite thing in the world to do is is what I get paid to do. At the end of our interview, the UPS man rang for Peter, and so I wasn't able to formally thank him, so I will do that now. Thank you very much, Peter Brown, for being our featured 12x12 author for September. For participants, I hope the chance of getting a critique of a sketch dummy and or a manuscript is enough motivation to get you writing those drafts this month. Bye.